Good morning, friends. It is good to greet you this morning. My name is Dan Morley. I'm a pastor here at the church. If you're a guest and we haven't yet met, I'd love to meet you. Pastor Gene and I are out in the lobby right after the service. Please take a moment and introduce yourself to us if we haven't yet met you by name.
that sets the table for us, that song. It sets our Thanksgiving table for us. There's so much for which we are thankful and delighted in and praising God. I invite you to turn into the Old Testament in that 45th chapter of Genesis with me. In the Pew Bible, though, you'll find it on page 40 in that Old Testament. For any Bible you have with you, those first 15 verses of chapter 45. Let us pray. Oh, Lord God, we pray that you open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits for the receiving of your holy word. And for all of our meditations, all of our thoughts, and all of the words which are shared at this time, may, oh, Lord, they be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Always in the name of Jesus, amen. We've been following this family. We've been seeing what's been happening in their lives, and we've been noticing that, well, in some ways, maybe there's not so much of a difference with their families and ours sometimes. And there are the challenges that we have there on how to live, how to love, how to just make life work in the way that God calls us to. So they've been tripping up along the way and being challenged with that and having some failure with it, but having success with that as well about how to discover God's call in their lives and following God's vision for them, for all of us. So let us open up our spirits here and hear where we are with this family. This is God's word. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, sent everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? And his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. They came closer. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me here before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you, your household, and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. Well, Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's quite a dramatic account there. It's quite a story that's told, especially when you know from where they had come and all that they had been through these years, the struggle the pain, the betrayal, the ways in which they had not been very brotherly with one another at all. And now they come to this place of a reconciliation, of being united. It's quite a powerful experience that we have. We can get wrapped up into the story, into this account, be overwhelmed by it. We all love a good ending, don't we? We all love a story that's told or an experience in life in which finally it comes down to a place where good things have finally happened, especially when it's been a rough road of it. 
We all love a good ending. When it all gets wrapped up just perfectly so, but it's often for us that we're in the middle between time, in that place from, from the beginning and not yet to that place where it all kind of comes together in such a beautiful way. Sometimes we're still wandering in that in-between place in life. That may be where you find yourself on this week at Thanksgiving, yet le- yearning and longing for and looking toward that happy place, that place where everyone is able to sit around the table and there's reconciliation and and there's a love that's shared fully and completely. But we have this vision that's there and this look forward. It, it's that which Joseph knew about. You see, he was able to, to look forward in his life knowing that, that God had his hand on him. That's something that he learned along the way. That ability to be able to look for where God is directing us and how God is calling us forward so that when, even when he was in the middle of the place in prison or the place of, of, of betrayal, even when he was in the middle of it, he was able to look ahead and see where God was taking him. So he could stay true to that and he could keep hope. And he could keep that promise there and, and have that joy in living no matter the circumstance which Paul speaks of because he knew where where God was taking him, or if he didn't fully know where God was taking him, he knew that wherever God would take him, goodness would be there, and he would be filled with thanksgiving for that. So he trusted in that, and he could look ahead then and know that God has taken us somewhere. We call this the providence of God, where God's hand is upon us and calling us and leading us forward, directing in life in in a fashion, and that God has good plans for us. God shared those plans with Father Abraham, uh, with, with Isaac, with the whole family along the way. And Joseph heard those promises and those plans that God had and said, okay, let's do this and go for it. And so was always anticipating and looking forward where God was going to have the next turn, the next opportunity, the next blessing that would be there, the next way that God would pull him up from a pit because he knew that he would. In some way, God would be there. Maybe not always knowing how it would take place but that he could trust God. And in that, Joseph would have hope. And when you have hope and you live within knowing God's promises are there, then we begin to relate with one another with hope. We begin to be relate with one another with, with godliness and with care. When we're trapped in the pit and we don't know or see or have that trust that God is going to be there for us, that's often when that brokenness that we experience or the pain or the trauma that we have, it then is given and dumped on other people and relationships become broken out of that. But trusting and knowing God is going to be there for me, is there for me, and somehow eventually we're going to get out of this mess, Ah, then I can begin treating other people too with that kind of hope. makes a difference in a relationship. I once heard that that when you pray to God, God has three answers for you in prayer. When you're in that pit, when you're in that place of prison, when you're in that place of of hopelessness, in a sense, and you lift up your prayers to God, that there are those three answers that God brings to you. It, It could be that God says, absolutely, yes, you got it. Here it is. Or maybe God simply says, not yet. It's coming. Not yet. You just got to keep faithful there. And keep trusting me, but it's not quite yet that it's going to happen. And then there's that third place that we come to where God says, you know, I've got something even better in mind for you. You see, that's not really that just God is saying absolutely no to us. But it may not be fulfilled in the ways that we're praying it and saying, God, will you make this happen? Oh, God, oh God, help me here like this and do this and that and God's answer and reply will come back to us. I've got something even better planned for you, even better than what you're praying for or hoping for right now. See how much trust is in that, faith in that, that God does have us in hand. That's providence. Providential care. God provides for us, will always be there for us. It's a faith in God, and as we do that, we're able to then be able to see God working. When we have that trust and faith that God's providential hand is upon us and directing and guiding us in life, hmm, we're able to see then it beginning to work and take place. Joseph had that place of faith, 
So he was able to see God moving, no matter where he was, no matter what was happening to him. He didn't need the end of the story, which everything was wrapped up pretty and perfect. In the middle of it, he still had power and joy in living. He still knew of the success in life. You see, when he was in prison there, after having been accused by Potiphar's wife uh, of, of seducing and seduction, he was thrown into jail, but even there he trusted God and he lived faithfully and truly and he served others in prison. And he rose to the head of being over all of those who were in the prison, even a steward in the prison. And then when he came forth from that prison, he was brought to that very second hand then in the whole nation of Egypt, a powerhouse in all the world. You know, when you look in that 45th chapter, you can see many indications and places of God's mighty hand and how it was that Joseph knew that God's hand was upon him. And you can begin to get that sense and that, that knowing about what is God's providential care? What is that and what is it about? For in verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph knew that God was directing this and all toward that place of preserving life. But then he goes on in verse number 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Even in verse 8, God, he has made me father to the Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. It is one of those testimonies here about how could that ever have happened and taken place. No one could ever have seen and forecast an, an earthly mind or spirit being able to look forward and seeing where Joseph had come from, and now he was going to say, God has made me the father to the Pharaoh, one of the, if not the most powerful person on this earth. And God has placed me in that perfect place, that perfect place in order to bring life to others. That's how God works, often taking that most unexpected opportunity. In, in our place of, of, of the smallness or in the weakness, God's greatness shines through, bringing Joseph to the place of, of being the father to the Pharaoh. How much more influence now? God is having upon the Pharaoh that who knows how he would be worshiping too and the many gods and the sun gods and all the ways. And now God was putting himself right there, right into the very household of the Pharaoh, doing his work, making it happen. Doing what? Bringing about life, bringing a remnant forth so that they indeed would be able to be a light to all the world, God's light in this world. Joseph keeps on saying about the providence of God and God's hand there in his life. This Thanksgiving time is a time to reflect upon that for yourself. Where is God's providential hand in your life? You see, it's all wound up within that providential care is the way God provides for us. And isn't that Thanksgiving? God has provided us abundantly with all that we need and God has a future there for us. So we're able to gather around a Thanksgiving table and thank God for all that he's taken us through in the past and got us to this place and has a future for us. It's his providential care. And we gather around this Thanksgiving table celebrating that and identifying it and witnessing it. So as you do, tell the stories, tell the younger generations especially, but tell all with whom you gather about the way that you have experienced and known God's hand in your life, his providential care. And the more you tell of that, and the more you witness it, the more you see it, and the more others hear the story of how God has touched your life, called you forward, led you in life, has plans for you and for all of us, the more you will all be able to see it, the more you will be able to witness it and experience it, especially when one is deep down in that place of a pit, he, you're able to see that it has indeed been God's hand calling us forward. How do we often respond to that place where we're in that pit? Once upon a time, a man fell in a pit and he couldn't get out. A philosopher came and said, your pit, it's only a state of mind. 
A parent said, if you would have listened to me, you wouldn't have gotten yourself into that pit in the first place. A realist said, ah, uh, yeah, that really is a pit. Mm -hmm. An idealist said, the world shouldn't have pits. An optimist said, things could be worse. And a pessimist said, things will be worse. And meanwhile, Jesus came and reached down into the depths of the pit and lifted him out. It is our God who reaches down to wherever we are, and we just trust him in that. Will lift us up from a pit. Will lift us up from a place where we've gotten lost because he has plans for us. Oh, yeah, we will thwart those or go in opposite directions of God's holy plans, but in God's marvelous way, he still finds us there. Uh, not that the pit was in God's plan, but God is able to use that pit. God is able to use that place uh, of greatest pain or greatest destruction or greatest darkness and shine forth hope and life and, and save us, uh, help, reconcile us. Because that's what it is where God saves us into life is this reconciliation with God and with each other. Reconciliation, lifting us from brokenness, healing us and mending us. I've heard said that GPS, you, you know, the global positioning system, satellite service, whatever, that GPS r really, really is about, about that very center. How do you find yourself? Be because that's what a GPS system does, isn't it? It helps you to locate where you are on this planet. In all of creation, it can, s it can find you or it can locate you so you know right where you're at. And there, when you know where you're at, you know where to get to and you know how to travel. Well, it's God's providential care is kind of like that, you might think. It, 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 God's providential care helps us to locate ourselves wherever we might be, in, in the pit, in the prison, in a place of, of, of famine and, and, and starving, and God will locate you right where you're at. But it starts there in that very center place because that's where God will begin with us, in that P, of that GPS. That P is providential care, providence of God trusting that God's hand is on you, with you. One might say it's like giving God the steering wheel. I remember when, when, I, was, when I was teaching my younger brother how to drive. I tell you right now, don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't go well. I was only three years older than Dave, and I was going to take him out, and I was going to teach him a thing or two because, yeah, when you're that age, you think, oh, I know it. I know it all. I, I can teach you how to drive. I've been doing it for three years, my whole life, you know. I can show you how to drive. And so I was teaching Dave how to drive, and, and it was time to teach him how to do it on, uh, on a stick shift, you know, on a manual drive car. And so I was going to try to teach him how to do that, and we had this... Little old, to uh, little old Fiat, a, a matchbox of a car, and, and the clutch on it, when you'd lift it up, it, would, it wouldn't engage until the very end of it. And it's like it had this powerful spring on it that would just push your foot up off the floor. And I was trying to teach him on that. Well, I'd heard that, how do you teach somebody about driving, but you take them to a parking lot? You know, nice space there, you can drive around. So I thought, okay, Dave, we're going to go up to the parking lot. And we went up to the, the mall on Saturday morning. Yeah, you, you see why you don't have somebody who's just at that age teaching somebody else how to drive. You, it's hard to engage in life when things are intense, when, when so much is happening from all directions and people and things are coming at you from all sides and all ways and all places. And I want to be in control. I want to take hold of it and try to steer it myself. This providential care is asking God to take the wheel. And you surrender yourself over and say, God, you're the, you're the one who's got to drive this. You're the one who needs to take the wheel of my life. It's giving God control of your life. Steps us into God's providential care. Where then I'm going to see, God, where are you taking us? I, I want you to take me wherever it is that, that you see to go and do and be and form my life completely and totally. I ask you to look into Romans chapter 12, and there you're going to discover, too, how Paul was expressing about this providential care of God, that you give your life into God's holy hand, and he'll shape you and form you into this holy vessel, into this beautiful being. That's what God does in his care with us. Spend time with God. 
in prayer, in worship, in scripture reading. And in doing so, you will become absorbed in that holy word and your life will take on the shape of God's word. And in that way, you begin to live into the providential hand of God, what God is doing and moving in your life. And you'll be able to see it then because the word of God is becoming a part of you and you'll be able to see how the word of God then becomes lived out in the world and that's the S. You connect yourself into spirit-filled people, into others in the faith. And you begin to have life intersecting with others. And as you intersect your life with other spirit-filled people, others who are within the very spirit of God in Jesus the Christ, your life, too, will, 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 will connect in with the body. And that's a reconciliation. How God connects us into one another so we're not doing it solo. God's providential care is not about touching one life uh, uh, separate from all other lives, but touching us together and connecting us and saving us all. You see, that was where Joseph was, was telling his brothers, God touched his life to save all life. And it's not just Joseph. It's every single one of us being a part of God's providential hand then participates in the way that God is working in us and among us to save life, to bring us all to life to reconcile us where we're broken and lost and need to be saved. So dwell within God's holy word, discovering the providential hand of God in life, that God provides for it all and calls us forward and connects us around the table of thanksgiving. And so we go forth from here in the love of God who teaches you how to live in that love in the name of Jesus, who graces you and forgives and reconciles you into the heart of God and with one another. And we go forth from here in the power of the Holy Spirit upon us all, leading us into this life that God promises. Amen.